Hello and welcome to this special edition of China Focus. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm China News producer Karen Chang. Well, it's the end of 2012. And let's see, Karen, did anything important happen in China this year? Well, maybe a few things. Here's our list of the top nine important events that happened this year. Number nine, Chen Guangchen fleeing to the U.S. Embassy. Blind Chinese legal activist Chen Guangchen had been under house arrest 18 months because he defended victims of forced abortion. On April 22, 2012, Chen made a daring escape from his home in Shandong province. It's a moonless night. Chen sneaks out of his room, climbs over a fence, past dozens of security personnel, and despite injuring his ankle and being blind, makes it to the road where a collaborator picks him up and drives him to Beijing. Not content with just an incredible escape, though, he proceeds to make headlines in pretty much every major newspaper around the world. Well, except in China, of course, when he enters the U.S. Embassy and asks for protection. After much diplomatic brouhaha, he leaves the embassy a few days later. He goes to a hospital to treat his ankle, but security guards surround him as well as his family back in Shandong. Who can protect him now? That's the question everyone was asking. But finally, after much diplomatic hemming and hawing, the Chinese government announces that Chen, quote, has the same right to travel abroad as any other citizen of China. Of course, how silly of us not to have known that. On May 19, Chen and family arrive in New York City, and he's now at NYU. Well, and speaking of the U.S., that brings us to number eight, China and the U.S. elections. Now, never before in U.S. presidential election history have the two major candidates brought up China so much. China was featured in the foreign policy documents. China came up in two out of three debates. China was in so many campaign ads that we did an entire episode of China Focus on it. It was Obama's week on China, Romney is a hypocrite on China, broadcast constantly in all eight U.S. states that actually matter in the electoral caucus. College. And of course, after November 6th, U.S. China relations go back to exactly the same as they were before all the campaign rhetoric. Speaking of rhetoric, number seven, China's maritime disputes. When it comes to international relations, nothing annoys the Chinese foreign ministry more than having to constantly remind its Asian neighbors that those important uninhabited rocks in the South China Sea and East China Sea have been, quote, China's inherent territory since ancient times. That includes islands like the Spratly Islands that are about five times closer to the Philippines. And don't forget about the Senkaku slash Diaoyu Islands, which are controlled by Japan but also claimed by China. It didn't help when Tokyo's mayor tried to buy the islands for commercial development or when Japan's central government tried to prevent a diplomatic row with China by buying them first. Whoops, that purchase on September 10 sparked wild protest across China under the pretending not to be involved guidance of the Communist Party. Chinese people smashed Japanese cars and boycotted Japanese restaurants. Some hospitals even refused to give patients Japanese-made medicine. But China's territorial claims aren't just angering Japan, the Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, and Vietnam. They're also angering Tibetans, whose nation has actually been under direct Chinese rule for more than five decades. And that brings us to number six, Tibetan protests. Why would Tibetans protest, you might wonder, when, according to state-run media, Tibetans, quote, enjoy unprecedented civil and political rights? Well, a lot of Tibetans are still unhappy. The Communist Party is destroying their language and culture and planting spies in Buddhist temples and giving the best jobs in Tibet to ethnic Chinese and destroying land for mining and development and making it illegal to even have a photo of the Dalai Lama. In 2012 alone, more than 80 Tibetans protested Chinese repression by setting themselves on fire. The Chinese response? They crack down harder. Authorities have set up a slew of new restrictions on Tibetans. They're forbidden from making international phone calls, going to funerals of people who've set themselves on fire, or even helping the victims' families. The Tibetans' response? More protests. Meanwhile, on the economic front, we have number five, Chinese companies expanding overseas. This year, we saw several big attempts by Chinese companies to make inroads in Western countries. It's part of the Communist Party's so-called going-out policy. In the U.S., China's state-run Industrial and Commercial Bank of China acquired a controlling share of the Bank of East Asia USA on July 6th. They now own 13 branches. It's small but a key foothold in the U.S. banking system. 
Then there's Chinese telecom giant Huawei. A U.S. House Intelligence Committee report on October 8th encouraged U.S. companies to stop buying equipment from Huawei and another Chinese telecom company, ZTE. The report said that they pose a potential security threat. And of course, there's Sinook, China National Offshore Oil Corporation. On December 7th, the Canadian government approved Sinook's takeover of Canadian oil company Nexen for $15.1 billion. And down under, state-run PetroChina invested $1.6 billion in the Browse natural gas project in Western Australia on December 12. In the same week, PetroChina announced they were buying a 49.9% stake in Ankana Shell Oil and Gas Project in Canada for $2.2 billion. These investments are all part of the party's push to expand China's economic foothold. But in the meantime, China's domestic economy has faced serious problems. And that brings us to number four, China's economic downturn. China's year-on-year -year GDP growth rate fell from 9.1 percent in Q3 last year to just 7.4 percent in Q3 this year. But is that really so bad? I mean, the U.S.'s Q3 growth was only 2 percent. Australia only grew half a percent. Well, it's true that 7.4 percent sounds pretty good, but as economist Gordon Chang pointed out on China Focus, it may be all a lie. Look at freight, electricity use and exports, and the real growth is probably much less. And if the Chinese economy slows, that could mean a serious political crisis. And speaking of political crisis, I seem to remember some big scandal involving a communist official murder the U.S. consulate. Well, it, it has been kind of an eventful year, and that brings us to number three, the Boise Lai Affair. February 6th, that's when this guy, Wang Li Jun, fled to the U.S. consulate. Apparently, he was so freaked out that his boss, Bo Xi Lai, was about to kill him that he went to the Americans. And after probably revealing a lot of state secrets, the U.S. rejected him, putting him back in the custody of Beijing. This had a huge ripple effect. Bo Xilai's opponents grabbed the opportunity. They kicked Bo Xilai out of the Politburo and eventually out of the party altogether. Now he'll face criminal charges. And let's not forget Bo's wife, Gu Kai Lai. She was convicted in August of murdering a British businessman, and Wang Lijun was convicted of covering it up, among other things. That much China's state media was happy to publicize. But what they tried to keep under wraps is the party's intense power struggle. And to make an extremely long, complicated story short, the Bo Xilai affair has exposed two factions. One faction involves people like outgoing party leader Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao. They hated Bo Xilai and his unbridled ambition. The other involves former, former party leader Jiang Zemin and his whole group of followers, including Bo Xilai. And what's the most important thing for Jiang Zemin's political faction? Keeping a secret about the most heinous of crimes. And that leads us to number two, organ harvesting. It goes like this. Everyone knows that Jiang Zemin led the Communist Party to persecute, arrest, and torture Falun Gong practitioners starting in 1999. But in March 2006, something even worse was uncovered. Two witnesses from China re revealed that state-run hospitals were killing people for their organs to be sold for transplants, and that many of these people were prisoners of conscience, Falun Gong. A lot of people found it hard to believe, that is, until 2012, this year, when a flurry of new evidence came out. It turns out Wang Li Jun, back when he was in Liaoning province, had spearheaded the on-site psychology research center in Jingzhou. That's him, dressed up like a doctor. And he did some weird experiments involving organ transplants on what he said were thousands of people. Where did he get the bodies, since China has no effective national organ donation system? Well, that's an interesting question. The Epoch Times says Wang told the U.S. consulate in February that he knew about Falun Gong practitioners being killed for their organs. In September, the House of Representatives held a hearing on organ harvesting. And in October, 106 Congress people co-signed this letter to the U.S. State Department, asking them to reveal what Wang Lijun really told the consulate. Well, that, along with more than 50 points of evidence, prove that China's state-run hospitals indeed have been involved in killing Falun Gong practitioners for their organs. That's one of the big secrets that Jiang Zemin's political faction is trying to keep under wraps. And that's why Jiang has done everything he can to put his own tight-lipped cohorts into positions of power. And that brings us to number one, the 18th Party Congress. The party's once-in-a-decade leadership transition took place in November. A smooth transition? Of course, that is, if you read state-run media. 
For China watchers, nothing has been more interesting or more frustrating to analyze than the insane behind-the-scenes infighting and backstabbing between Jiang Zemin's faction and Hu Jintao's faction. The result? Many months and dozens of China Focus episodes later, China has seven new leaders. At least four of them are in Jiang's faction. And what does that mean for the prospect of political reform? If you look at the analysis, well, not much. Well, those are the top nine important things that happened in China this year. Karen, do you think 2013 will be just as interesting? Well, I hope so. Otherwise, we may both have to be looking for new jobs. Well, on that note, thanks for watching, and hopefully we'll see you again next year.